Welcome to Hebraic Insights in the Gospels. Join us every Sabbath on Zion Road Radio for a look at the life, deeds, and words of Yeshua Messiah and his followers. From the Torah-centric Hebraic perspective, they were originally lived and written in. Today's program is about Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 22. What is the authority of the Son of Man? What does the term Son of Man mean? Who is Messiah as the Son of Man? What can we find about the Son of Man in Bible prophecy? Why did it have to be a man? That would save us. Why did Yeshua refer to himself as the Son of Man so often? And what does that have to do with us? Stay tuned through to the end of today's program for Eliyahu Ben David's insight on these questions and more in Mark chapter 2. And now, here's today's scripture portion Mark chapter 2, verse 1. Through verse 22. When he entered again into Capernaum after some days, it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even around the door, and he spoke the word to them. Four people came carrying a paralytic to him. When they could not come near him for the crowd, they removed the roof where he was. When they had broken it up, They let down the mat that the paralytic was lying on. Yeshua, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But there were some of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like that? Who can forgive sins but Elohim alone? Immediately Yeshua, perceiving in his spirit, that they so reasoned within themselves, said to them, Why do you reason these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to tell the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Arise and take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, Arise, take up your mat, and go to your house. He arose and immediately took up the mat and went out in front of them all. So that they were all amazed and glorified Elohim, saying, We never saw anything like this. He went out again by the seaside. All the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, He saw Levi, the son of Halphi, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. It happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners sat down with Yeshua and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. The scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Yeshua heard it, he said to them, Those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came and asked him, 
Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? Yeshua said to them, Can the groomsmen fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they can't fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then will they fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the patch shrinks and the new tears away from the old, and a worse hole is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the skins, and the wine pours out and the skins will be destroyed, but they put new wine into fresh wineskins. And now, here's some insight from Eliyahu ben David on that portion. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is. And walk in it. And you find rest for your soul. Hello, friends. Great to have you with us tonight. And once again, we are going to be getting into the book of Mark. We're starting Mark chapter 2. And this is a very dynamic chapter. And we're entitling tonight's whole section here, Authority of the Son of Man. And truly, if anyone ever had authority on this earth, it was our Messiah, Yeshua. Well, we want to look at this subject of the authority of the Son of Man. And I'd just like to underscore a few points and share a few things. Here in Mark chapter 2, we have the case of the paralytic. And it's an amazing thing, really, when you think about it, because Sometimes a person can't do something for themselves that they really need. And I think it's pretty cool how his friends got him in there. We can all learn from that, I think. And it does take faith to do that, to help someone else. But the part I was going to look at here is what he said to the scribes and Pharisees that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And this is very interesting, this title, the Son of Man. This is the first time in the book of Mark that this title comes up where Yeshua is speaking this about himself. Before this, he's called the Son of God. Now he's called the Son of Man. And some people puzzle over this because, after all, he's forgiving sins. Shouldn't it be God forgiving sins rather than men forgiving sins? And I think that's really the shocking part of it, right? Let's take a closer look at this. This term, son of man, comes from the Psalms, and it's found in many other places in the Tanakh, but Psalm 8, 4 through 6 gives us a foundation for what this term actually means. There it says, What is man that you think of him? What is the son of man that you care for him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You make him ruler over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. Now, in its primary meaning, this is talking about people, human beings. And I think the writer of this psalm is rather amazed that the Creator has put 
this kind of authority and power into the hands of mere humans to make him ruler over all the works of his hands. That's an amazing amount of authority that has been given to men. Well, let's look at this a little more. There's actually two different Hebrew words that are used here for man. One is enosh, and this word points to the mortality of a person, the weakness of man, actually. It's a term showing man as a mortal. And that's why in this phrase, what is man that you think of him, it uses this term for a man. What is a mortal, weak person that you would have regard for him? And then it says, what is the son of man that you care for him? This is a different word. It's the word Adam. And it does mean a man, but it's also the name of the first man, Adam. And so it means man in the sense of being named after our first father. And the term son of man, what is that if that's not emphasizing that? Being a descendant of our first father, Adam. So this is the meaning of the term in its most basic meaning that we find in the Tanakh. A son of Adam. And this refers back, of course, to the book of Genesis where Elohim said, let's make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Elohim created man in his own image. So the psalm is referring back to what Yahweh originally did when he created man, male and female, he created them. They function as a unit, don't they? And gave them dominion over the earth. How's that going? Do you ever find that, like, your dominion in this earth is frustrated? Something went wrong, didn't it? And as a matter of fact, a lot of people feel not only like their dominion is frustrated, but like they don't have any dominion. Like they don't have a lot of control over their life and that they're forced to do things a lot differently than they would like to do them. So the reality of what's going on today is very different than. Yahweh's intention. But let us give him credit for his very high and wonderful intention for humanity. This shows us the problem is not from him, is it? It didn't come from him. Revelation chapter 12 tells us where that problem really came from. The great dragon, the old serpent, the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He came along, and he wanted that dominion over the earth for himself. And so he deceived the whole world, starting with our father Adam, actually with his wife Eve. But Adam was the one who was responsible, being the family head. And so he gave up. He lost the dominion over the earth. And that old serpent took up that place of rulership over the world. And that's the reason why we don't experience the dominion over the world that we should be experiencing. Because that happened. 
Now, when Yeshua came, he mentioned this. He says, now the prince of this world will be cast out. He's talking about what's going to happen as a result of his sacrifice. And the prince of the world he's talking about is whom? It is Satan, isn't it? So I I believe by this statement, he's acknowledging calling him a prince that he actually does have that dominion. He actually does have that authority. Isn't it amazing that Satan is ruling with dominion that came from Yahweh? That's pretty amazing. That was given up by man. What a mess. But it's going to come to an end. Daniel chapter 7 tells us about the day that it's going to come to an end. He said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, there came with the clouds of the sky one like a son of man. And he came even to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. So what we find here in Daniel chapter 7 and many other places is that Yahweh never gave up his original purpose that man should have dominion. So a son of man was prophesied to come who is going to take up that dominion. In Psalm 110.1, it shows Yahweh speaking to that one, saying, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool for your feet. Many places throughout the Tanakh we have these prophetic statements of this one, the Son of Man, also the Messiah, who would turn this thing around and restore the dominion that had been lost. In Mark 14, what we'll find is the high priest talking to Messiah, saying, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed? And Yeshua said, I am. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of the sky. You notice he's referring to these very scriptures we've just been looking at. And he's calling himself the Son of Man. So he's not only referring to the phrase that's found in Psalm 8, but he's also talking about the phrase that we found it in Daniel 7. Now to that, we could add other places, for instance, in Ezekiel. And in the book of Enoch, it talks about a messianic figure called the Son of Man as well. And this definitely could be a part of it. But there's no question, if we look at this, the question here was, are you the Messiah? And Yeshua is saying, yeah, I am the Messiah. And then he's calling himself the Son of Man, who's going to sit at the right hand of power and is coming with the clouds of the sky. That's pretty amazing. It's really kind of like the whole picture in three sentences, isn't it? Paul added an aspect to this that I think is interesting. This is in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Now Messiah has been raised from the dead. He became the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since death came by man, the resurrection of the dead also came by man. For sin in Adam all die, so also in Messiah all will be made alive. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So, it had to be 
a man that would save us. And this is why we find Yeshua, when he's on earth, constantly referring to himself as the Son of Man. Because he is wanting to restore this dominion where it belongs. This is why I like to say there's a man in heaven. Because if there's not, we're not saved. There has to be a man in heaven who is going to return on the clouds. That's what the scriptures tell us. Well, what does all this mean as we look into this a little further? Well, it means that this dominion is not only taken up by Messiah, but it is also restored to human beings. And this is really the exciting thing about all of this. And that's really what Messiah was showing us. That's why he would do these miracles, and he would call himself the Son of Man. And he even said, you will do greater things than these. Didn't he say that? Can you picture yourself doing greater things than he did? You should. You should. You know, this is a change of thinking we all need. We have to not deny what he said. Right? And that's what we're really talking about as we look into Revelation chapter 12. And I've taught on this before, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. But what we find there is the woman, heavy with child, the woman Israel. And she's about to give birth to a son, a man-child. This is the kingdom. You could call it the kingdom company. You could call it the renewed remnant of Israel. Or you could call it the body of the Son of Man in the earth. Couldn't you? And the destiny of this man-child is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. To rule with the authority of the Son of Man. So what we see is Messiah has made the way and he set the example for the sons of Adam or the children of Adam, to rise up in the authority of the Son of Man to rule the earth with him. When do we start doing that? Well, we know when he comes in the clouds of heaven, he's going to decide that issue once and for all, right? But when we look at what he did, is he not setting an example for us to actually act in that authority now in this world. And when we see how his disciples responded to that, they were just like us when they were with him, right? In other words, when he said, you're going to do greater things than these, could he accept that? Could he believe that would be true? And yet, what happened after he ascended to heaven? When you read what happened, the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. Certainly, collectively, they did greater things than him because he never left Judea. And they brought the gospel to all of the known world. Is that not greater? From a certain perspective, it is. What about us? You know, sometimes I feel like one of those disciples trembling in the boat during the storm. Do you ever feel like that? Then I hear the words. 
you of little faith. We are called to rise up in the authority of the Son of Man. And I believe, just like those disciples, that even if we haven't reached that point yet, as we keep moving forward with him, we keep applying the things in our life that he shows us, we keep walking with him, we will get to that place where together we will do greater things. You have been listening to Hebraic Insights in the Gospels. Some of the scripture verses mentioned in today's program are Psalms 8, verse 4 through verse 6, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through verse 27, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, John chapter 12, verse 31 through verse 33, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through verse 14, Psalms 110, verse 1, Mark chapter 14, verse 61 and verse 62, and Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. Further teachings and study materials on the woman in Revelation chapter 12, Yeshua as the Son of Man, the Son of Man in Bible prophecy, our role in taking back dominion, and what that dominion means, along with many other related topics, can be found at our membership site, Zion Tabernacle. Sign up is free. Just go to zion.net. That's T-S-I-Y-O-N dot N-E-T. New programs on the Gospels will be airing every Sabbath on Zion Road Radio. Tune in next Shabbat to learn more about your dominion and the example that Yeshua Messiah set for us as the Son of Man. Shabbat Shalom! Would you like to hear more of Eliyahu's teachings? Do you have a question or prayer request and would like to get in touch with one of our volunteers for help? Or do you just want to know more about Eliyahu Ben David and Zion Ministry? Visit our website at zion.org where you can 
Listen to more teachings from Eliyahu Ben David straight from the homepage of our website. Check out our books, DVDs, internet videos, and other social media outlets. Learn more about Eliyahu and the Zion team on the About page. See what our ministry's mission is on the Remnant Vision page. Send a question or prayer request from our Contact Us page. Or click Join Us in the menu bar to learn about our community site, Zion Tabernacle. To find out more about Zion Ministry, go to zion.org. That's zion.org, spelled T-S-I-Y-O-N dot O-R-G. G.